Thank you so much for joining us today. I know that, uh, first of all, I became aware of your company because Heaton Shaw was just going nuts. And I've known Heaton for many, many years on Twitter. I used to be in the Valley okay. for, uh, for most of my for most of my 30s, I spent there, and then I decided to come home to Miami about two years ago, pre-pandemic, and okay. then now it's a little crazy. But, you brought uh, Silicon Valley with you. You know what? It, I don't know. We'll see. I, you know, it's, there's a lot of stuff happening on Twitter, but uh, we'll see if it actually happens. Like, you know, Silicon Valley has sustained the, the test of time for a very long time for a lot of reasons and not just because yeah. of a couple of VCs and stuff like that. So we'll see, listen, I, I would love there to be an, uh, a massive ecosystem that happens here that has half of the success that the Valley has had, but yeah. uh, we'll see. I, I know that our world has changed quite a bit. And so I think that it doesn't have to be Silicon Valley. It could be, you know, what they're calling Miami tech now or whatnot. Right. But, uh, but yeah, as long as there's, you know, it's fun and, and we're supporting each other. Um, that's what I care about. But let's talk a little bit about yourself. Why don't you take a quick second to introduce yourself? Tell us a little bit about copy.ai and, you know, what What the hell did, were you thinking <laughs> to get yeah. on this journey? Yeah, so I've been a founder or a um, venture capitalist for the past five years with mm -hmm. my co-founder, Chris Liu. So we had helped employees exercise stock options at venture-backed companies. And mm -hmm. so we had seen hundreds of companies and had invested in hundreds of companies as well. And he and I um, have been looking for the next big wave in tech and trying to figure out what the next frontier would be. And when GPT-2 launched in 2019, it was pretty clear to me that it would be increasingly powerful and that its creativity was off the charts. So when GPT-3 launched this past summer and we saw these amazing demos on Twitter, we knew that this, is, this could be it. This could be the next big wave. So we started building these little side projects and trying to figure out, okay, is there a market for this? Um, and my hunch was that it was, it was a good enough model that you could have a commercially viable product with it. So the fourth MVP we launched was copy.ai. We launched it on Twitter. We had 2,000 free signups the first two days of launch. And those started to convert to paying customers. And then pretty soon we knew that we have like a real startup to launch. And so we quit our jobs and we transitioned out and started building this full time. And here we are about less than five months later, we've had 60,000 a month in recurring revenue and uh, we're making our, our third hire this week. So things are going well, you know? Dude, I'd really say well. so. And the product is very much product led, right? Like, you know, I've signed up to it. I, I, I'm probably going to start using it at our, our new company, yeah. um, Reprise, because I'm heading up content and stuff like that there. You know, when you think about that journey early on and you decided, first of all, we're going to go product led and we want this to be a self-serve for a variety of reasons. What was kind of the, the mindset when you decided we're going to do this thing, self-serve, at least, you know, have that tier, go to market with that, as opposed to we're going to build out something that's going to be a little more sales led or human led. And maybe we're going to go up market and go, you know, out of the box, uh, out of the box, like start to get, you know, five figure deals and those sort of things. Yeah. We didn't think about that <laughs> at the time. It was mostly like, hey, what, what little thing can we build and test? And when you do it that way, and you have 2,000 signups, I mean, you're not thinking about going up market. You're really thinking about, oh, I'll just add a Stripe subscription integration, and then I'm done. Mm -hmm. and it's obviously product-led. And then the question is, is that going to be enough to sustain a, a company? Or do you just put the sales hat on and try to go to market that way and win one deal after the next? And um, yeah, so for us, I, we didn't have to even get to that point. It, it just kind of worked um, from, from the bottoms up um, with the product-led growth, which has been amazing because that's, that's a great feature to have for a business model, right? Yeah. Like it, can, it can scale as, long, as hard as you want. So it's not dependent on us you know, doing a lot of um, outreach and a lot of custom building, which has been really nice. 
Well, I mean, first of all, that's, that's the holy grail, right? If you can get that. You know how many companies for so long have been trying to go product-led, you know, even before this category, which I think is probably about, you know, four years, five years old, I, I would say, is when I started to see the folks over at OpenView start to talk about it and blog about it. But, you know, people have been really trying to do it. And I feel like it's, it's really, really difficult because it's so very close to a lot of the motions that you would have to go through uh, at, within a, like a, a consumer or B2C app, right? But, but B2B as well. So I, I think in, on one side, it's like easier to be able to say, okay, well, let's fix that problem within the uh, enterprise or within an organization. On the other side, it's all right, well, how do we get it to, to like grow itself, right? Were there any initial sort right. of tactics or strategies you used to, to like, you know, set the, set this on fire? I mean, 2000 signups right away is pretty good, man. Well, we, yeah, I mean, I've been on Twitter, like not heavily, but more heavily, you know, like increasingly heavy for like 18 months, now maybe 12 months leading up to that. So since we kept launching things, each time we launch, we get more followers. And then I think at about 2000 by the time I launched, and then I asked everybody that I followed basically to retweet it or like mm -hmm. it, like, Hey, launch this would appreciate your support. And that helped propel it. And then I think it got picked up in the Twitter algorithm too, because we got a little bit more reach with that one. Um, so yeah, that was like, that's a, that's a really great way to kick off a launch, a product launch, you know? Yeah. So was it very much like, Hey, our go to market is Twitter and focused on Twitter. At least initial. Yeah. The initial kickoff was that for sure. And did you find that like hashtags, uh, those sort of things were, were valuable or just really no. just driving engagement? Yeah. Engagement. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Be, be interesting. I mean, that's it. You know? Well, dude, I, I follow you and, you know, I've been following you for months now and I've just been seeing the MRR move up and yeah. that tweet alone is yeah. fucking badass, man. Yeah, it's a good like, tweet. It's you know, a good tweet. Yeah. Like that one probably gets pretty, pretty good engagement, doesn't it? I, it does. I tried to stick some more, some more content in it now. So it's not just the MRR, although occasionally I'll do it. So today's was, um, you know, 60K MRR and then in like a space and then the next line said hired again number three bills in public on twitter the rocket ship like it's getting people excited we're literally recruiting from twitter so anyone that follows us should should be seeing this you know you, hey who wants to work on something cool like i'm literally on twitter hiring people that's amazing you know well look it's at what the city of miami mayor just did right like, like it's insane. very similar right yeah and so, so there's a little story there. He's married to my cousin, Gloria. And okay. uh, I'm, I'm like, you know, of course, I hadn't seen Gloria in 20 years because I'd been in New York and the Bay Area for a while. And, uh, and so, like, I pinged him when I got back. And I was like, hey, you know, I'm in text or, you know, I forgot exactly what I said, but I said, you know, I, I really would like to help the ecosystem here and get involved because he's always been like known to be forward thinking. And then a week later, this whole like, can I help whatever tweet that went viral? And right. I haven't been able to get in touch with him ever since. <laughs> but but it's yeah. so fucking interesting. It's like Twitter is, has it got there? I mean, I worked at Twitter, you know, and. We were still trying to figure it out early on. Um, and this was nine years ago, right? Right. About no, that. okay. So Twitter, yeah. I, yeah, I've studied it. I've studied it some more and then I've studied it some more. And the thing is, yes, like everything in life is about finding a point of leverage and, and basically extracting maximum leverage out of something. And usually there's going to be one channel that works better than any other channel and you dominate it like you really go get all of it so for anyone like for mayor suarez like it's so easy <laughs> it's like this brain dead obvious growth channel mm -hmm. he can he can get you know keith or boys to town he he just got peter Thiel to town mm -hmm. to at least live there they bring like their friends to at least buy a house, whether or not they're there full time. They start tweeting about, hey, we're down here. You know, hey, like Keith's been having meetings, like he said, nonstop for six months. 
mm-hmm. 9, 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. every day, face-to-face meetings. You have this the tax base advantage, and you have like uh, the beach. Yeah. So those are really great advantages, and and they've been able to pick up you know some New York, a lot of New York momentum. But I'd say the big thing is tech, mm-hmm. and what the pandemic's proved is that you can build a company anywhere. You don't have yeah. to be in San Francisco. So if that's the case, then you're not stuck in San Francisco. No one's stuck. You can move and live wherever you want. And when that happens, then it's not about access to talent and that that stuff. It's lifestyle and culture. And that's where I don't think Silicon Valley is really thinking that through. Like mm-hmm. what kind of, what kind of cultural, you know, our, what kind of culture and like quality of life are we really offering? And if, if the answer is not much or it's not very good, or people don't feel like they're appreciated in a, in a place where they're generating almost all the, the wealth and the equity, then that the talent's going to leave. The talent's going to go somewhere where they want to be. Yeah. So, the, you know, Suarez picked up this beautiful momentum. My, my best performing tweet of all of last year was about Miami. It was in May. And I said, just talked to a prominent angel investor who's moving to Miami, you know, cited uh low lower taxes like beachfront real estate and like better fiber internet or something like that you know it got like over two thousand likes and so this this was like hitting this central nervous point on twitter and the reason i posted it was because i i'd had three friends move down there just from sf to there within a two-week period and none of them even knew that the other person had gone there. They basically just went and rented an Airbnb. So I was trying to figure out like, all right, these people are great angel investors. Angel investors are all about early stage traction, all about it. So they can sense signal and they can predict trends way before everyone else. So I started looking at the ecosystem, figure out, hey, who else is down there? And there were some really incredible tech people, really incredible. So you had like the founder of Yex, the founder of Digital Ocean, mm-hmm. the founder of Chewies. Alexis Sohanian was there, which I didn't realize. Yeah, I didn't know either. Shervin Pishavar is there. Like that's already a crew. They just were not really, that's not really a part of the tech ecosystem down there and like the accelerators and whatnot. Um, so I saw like, we've well, got potential. I'm like, this is, this is exciting. So I was looking at creating a founder's house down there. And it was, but it was just too hard to rent a place because I had, I had founders that wanted to go and like just room together. I was like, we could just take that, promote it and do all sorts of stuff. And then it got, it was just too hard to get any real estate rentals. Yeah. So we, I skipped that. I was like, you know, okay, this is interesting, but I'm, I'm not going to focus on that. Let me go build some GPT-3 apps. Nice. <laughs> good, just, well, good call on that. Well, listen, yeah, very good call. But if you do want any real estate, I can hook you up with my real estate guy. Okay. He's, I've known him since we were, uh, grew up together. We were about 11 years old. Wow. Uh, so he manages my property when, uh, um, that's awesome when i'm not around but let's talk a little bit about that transition because there's so many like early stage entrepreneurs who are you know playing with products or side projects and they're seeing a little traction and often you know sometimes you jump off the cliff too early and there's a variety of different issues with stress yeah. and cat runway and those sort of things where if you jump off too early you can really just kill the business to you know right away but if you're just doing this zombie thing where you're like you know phoning it in at work during the day and then coming home and you know working till 3 a.m you know that's not going to get it either so when did you know it was the right time to quit a great job you know as a vc yeah. and double down uh when i bet when we validated just the traction metrics so we knew what the paid conversion rate was and we knew how many organic signups we were getting per day. At that point, I knew it was venture backable. And we had maybe, you know, total spent like 40 hours building it, which wow. is nuts, right? It's not much because yeah. GPT-3 was doing the work. So we, this is not typical. I'd say most founders have, are in that scenario that you laid out. And there are hundreds of, of people in that, in that situation right now on Twitter. And um, my, my intuition is that 
the problem is not the product necessarily, it's their distribution and then their understanding of how to monetize. I think if that's where the weaknesses are for most, most of those people, and then the third one would be understanding what a 10x product looks like. Mm. So if you just listen to your customers and users, you can get incremental improvements, but it's not going to give you that big, big, big result that's going to like set off a chain reaction which you really need to have a big amount of traction. So because my, my co-founder, Chris and I, we were, you know, we're investors. So I have my own quantitative angel investing metrics. Like literally just calculate these numbers. And I was like, we don't get a good score, Chris. <laughs> so I was like, we fall short in two key areas. I said, one, traction. We don't mean traction. I'm not quitting my job until I get traction with something that's meaningful. So we knew that, which, which meant I didn't have to like labor over, do I quit my job or not? Right. So just mentally, that was really refreshing because you could have fun. You could launch stuff and not take it so seriously and not labor over all that stuff. Yeah. Um, the second one was, um, the second one was we haven't worked at startups ourselves. We've invested in early stage companies. So our weakness will be building and managing a team. Hmm. So that's like the, the thing we're going through now, now that we've left, but we knew that coming in. So yeah. we were, we were more hesitant to like go hire a bunch of people and just because I, we thought that would blow, blow us up. Like we would not be able to manage it. Yeah. <laughs> so. Well, that resonates pretty deeply with me just because yeah. I've been on the other side of the coin where, you know, like uh, I've always been an operator or a founder, you know, and I've made a thousand mistakes. You know, I'm 40 years old this year. And, yeah. Well, um, and congratulations, should... man. Thank you. Thank you. I made it. Yeah. I'm 33. Uh, all right. Yeah. Well, dude, like when I was 33, I was, uh, well, not too long ago, but I, I was uh, hacking on a startup, of course, in the Valley broke. Um, yeah. Because I, actually, you know what? Yeah, was it? No, yeah, actually about 33, I was, uh, I had, we had sold the business to Twitter. So, but I wasn't a founder. I was the early, early employee. So it was my, one of my best friend's companies yeah. and so you know he brought me in when they were like three founders i was the first hire and um i was always a really good first hire uh for non-technical stuff because at one point i was a nightclub promoter so i figured out how to do like <laughs> promotions and yeah you know um and uh, and events and then i was always a salesperson i was a door-to-door -door salesperson i had also started a couple software companies and and failed so you know, I had that chip on my shoulder. Um, and so, you know, I, I, so that was a win and, you know, made a little money there, but definitely not, you know, didn't hit what I had uh, thought I would be kind of yeah. at that point. But, um, but, you know, I, I had learned so many things over the last several years. And if it was not one thing, it was another, right. If it was like, Oh, well, you don't have enough traction or early days, it was, Oh, you don't have a technical founder on your team or co-founder, go and get one. You're, you know, outsourcing it to a, a rail shop is not going to work, you know, back when, uh, yeah. when that was super popular. Yeah. And so, you know, it kind of changed. And you asked me a question, like you, you sort of asked, like, what, what advice would I give? Well, I'm going to say that uh, my advice is, first of all, I haven't had a, 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 the win that I was looking for. I've always ended up having to shut it down for one reason or the other. But I can tell you that there's, I, you know, there, there are some things that I observed with the ones that have won. And, um, yeah. and, then, uh, and then there were certainly things that I think were obvious. And I've had the pleasure of speaking to thousands of founders over the last decade. And what I find is, you know, team, number one team is incredibly important. And yeah. Uh, and it, it's almost like the most important and, you know, and I, and I know a lot of folks would maybe disagree with that, but let me say, let me explain. I, why. Look, I have tweeted the team is the company. 
So yeah. I'm with you on this, right? Yeah. Well, well, first of all, it's like <clears throat> outside of the technical chops or, you know, business chops, if you have the right team, you can like hire for that, right? If yeah. you have the right team, you can walk into a, a meeting with some investors and they'll invest and support you. And if you have, if you don't have the right team, you're not, you're not even going to get to like step one to give yourself even, a, a, even a chance to win. And, um, and it ends up blowing up and those sort of things. And so what does a, a good team look like? I think that a good team, and this is a more esoteric sort of response. A good team for me is going to be a, a team that can actually work together with as little ego as possible that are going to, uh, understand when they're wrong understand and and uh, and uh, accept when maybe there's some some weaknesses and i hate to say weaknesses but just you get my point um it, on you know within that team and then be be able to proactively say hey listen i'm not great at this uh we need to fill this gap you know those sort of things another one is taking care of yourself boy i can't tell you how many fights over the last you know 16, 17 years I had with co-founders um, because of, you know, ego and, sh and the stress that's going on at that time. Yeah. And, and unless you're like a Elon Musk who you can just spin up a bunch of shit, you know, all day and, you know, you're not going to really uh, go to zero and live in a car. Um, and that's well, still stressful, well, if you, right? Well, yeah, if you take a step back with PayPal, I mean, he got fired as CEO, you know, when he was out of, out of the country. Like that's, that's a starting point. And then Tesla, he threw out, like he was not a founder. He invested in the series A was on the, was the chairman and then ended up throwing out the, the founders of that. So I don't, I think that there is a natural struggle, you know, irrespective. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Well, I got so a that's, buddy. That's why like my, my co-founder and I, we've worked together. We were best friends and best together like that relationship is super strong and that's actually one of the quantitative metric points for an angel investment is it has this this team work together to have a long-term friendship because you have to draw deep on that just with all the man you know managing all the the uh, anxiety the team like politics products bad news good news how do you manage it you know and and we're remote i haven't even seen chris in a, over a year since before we even launched so i'm That's excited tough. to see him man you know excited yeah. to see him but a lot of phone calls you know totally. a lot of a lot of slack messages and you're in tennessee right yeah That's awesome yeah he's in houston right now cool well paul we don't want to take up uh any more of your time and i say we uh i'm not sure maybe <laughs> my co-host yeah. which is somewhere with my grandma hovering, hovering yeah. around here in spirit no, fun. but uh but yeah it, like if uh, if folks want to learn more about uh you know copy.ai or follow you on twitter and learn mm -hmm. more about what you're up to what are the best handles to reach you paul yakubian that's my handle awesome. i got the handle in 2010 i was like i'll use this later and then i got got on in 2019 <laughs> so. And we'll go ahead and put the uh, the URL in the post here. Awesome. Awesome. Well, Paul, have a wonderful day. And I'm going to keep you. following you on, on Twitter. We're going to be Do a customer nice. uh, because I need your help. <laughs> nice. Because, like, you know, with, with the fire hose of content that you need to put out there, it's, there's no it's big. Way. It's big. And what's nice about content is if you're a bootstrap founder, that is your A plus, like, A plus marketing channel to reach your first customers. You know, that's how we did it. I know it's feasible. I know it's possible. And I'm seeing other people do it every day now. Awesome. Uh, and Twitter is the best channel for that by yeah. far. You know, I, I was just actually thinking about our, our YouTube strategy today. And uh, I know I want to like write really robust keyword heavy um, descriptions. So I'm hoping, I'm pretty sure that I could see where the roadmap could go in, in a couple of different ways, but I'm really stoked to see, uh, you know, the product evolve and uh, yeah. And like I said, we'll, we'll be a customer. Thanks. Awesome. Love to hear it. Thanks for having awesome. me. Yeah. Thank you. Have a great day. All right. You too. Bye. Bye.